Hey everyone, good evening. We have an update for you from last session that is vitally important that we take heed um, to the dispensation, you know, the surroundings and everything um, that's going on. I want to start off with this, uh, which I told you I'd come back later to bring a few things about establishing um, the covenant, the covenant of Yahweh. Not a cult, not a secret society, but a covenant of Yahweh. Why? And your because is that a covenant plays more of a permanent role and it has requirements. And that's what the enemy does not, the enemy of your soul does not want you to realize that you've been deceived. I'm going to say it again. The enemy of your soul that's against you and, and trying his best to get you to work in the kingdom of darkness. And you know what's something that I'm realizing? Darkness is just what it is. Darkness is darkness. Because you're, you're functioning as a blind man with sunglasses on. Yes, you're functioning as a blind man of mankind with sunglasses on. The blind leading the blind. And so the list of covenants, we're starting with Noah's family and the, the substance of Noah's family. Come in and shut the door. Glory, hallelujah. Come in and shut the door. So this family was the example of preservation, pre preserving that one family, that one seed to carry on the uh, procreation of mankind. We're talking about Genesis 6, 18 and 20. But with you, I shall establish and ratify my covenant. That's Noah's family. You notice the spe specific number of members that went on the ark. But what I love about that story is he took that one family, but he told them they had to shut the door. The part that we probably didn't realize is once they shut the door, nobody's going to go out and nobody's going to come in. So he says, my covenant and you will come into the box. You your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you will bring two of every sort into the box to keep alive with you. They will be male and female. And they will be male and female. They will be male and female of fowl after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every sort will come to you to keep alive. And that's with Noah's family. So that's the preservation during the flood. The next part of this story um, to get us where we're remembering how to pray. This is all of everything we're dealing with today is really setting up pl a platform or a pattern of praying. So the next part will be with Noah's family. The substance part of it would be never again will all life be cut off by a flood. You know what well, we had to represent that. We had the we have, I shouldn't say had, we have the rainbow bowl that we're talking about the evidence of the promise. So with this particular uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 1 through 17, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and the fear of you and the dread of you will be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, 
upon all that moves upon the earth and upon all the fish of the sea. This also they are delivered into your hand. Every moving thing that lives will be food for you, even as the green herb. I have given you everything, but you will not eat flesh with its life, which is in the blood. Hallelujah. So therefore, this is where we get our dietary laws about not eating uh, anything that has shedded blood and not drink blood either. But when we look at this particular scripture and it's setting these particular prerequisites, and surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast, I shall require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, I shall require the life of a man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, will his blood be shed. Hallelujah. For he made man in the image of God, and you be fruitful and multiply. Second time you're told, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundant in the earth and multiply in it. And God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And behold, I am establishing my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl of the cattle and of the beast of the earth with you for all that go out of the box to every beast of the earth and i will confirm my covenant with you neither will all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, nor will there, there be any more of a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of my covenant, which I am giving between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I have set my rainbow in the cloud and it will be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth and it will be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow will be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is be between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters will no longer become a flood to destroy all flesh and the and the bow the rainbow will be in the cloud and I shall look upon it so I can remember the everlasting covenant between God and everything that's a living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the token of the covenant I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Noah covenant. These seven precepts are known as the Noetic Covenant, the covenant for all non-Jews. The requirements are social laws to refrain from blasphemy, idolatry, worshiping, adultery, bloodshed, robbery, and eating flesh cut from a living animal. Acts 15, 19, 20. Uh, I call that the Apostles' Creed, where this particular uh, covenant is set in place. Actually, the Christian church is being encouraged to start there. Okay, start right there. I'm going to read it to you because it's, it's really significant if you are supposedly a bishop and the person that's over the church. Just a reminder of what God said was supposed to be established as an ordinance. On this account, I judge that we should not cause difficulty for those of the heathens who are turning to God, but to instruct them to abstain from the pollution of idols and from immortality and from the meat of strangled animals and from 
the blood. I'm going to read that again. Now, I don't even know. I can't claim to know what, what a Christian denomination's ordinances look like. I don't know if people are making them up as they think they've been uh, given, instructed by God. I'm not sure. But I do know for the sincere ones, this fits every framework. Acts chapter 15, 19 and 20. So on account, I judge that we should not cause difficulty for those. In other words, let's, let's not perplex it and make it all out, you know, outrageously uh, hard. We want to be as, you know, comfortable, but yet staying within the guidelines. Comfortable with what's expected of you. And keep in mind, the key to this verse is that we're talking about the heathens, the ones that were considered to be um, not in a covenant. So we want to we want to make people that's not saved. We don't want to make them frizzled and confused even more. We we really can't even do anything but obey the word and love people. And tell them the truth. But the truth is not going to always be some form of compromise. You see, truth is not going to be compromised by everybody. Somebody say amen. So therefore, those heathens who are turning to God, but to instruct them to abstain from the pollutions of the idols and from immortality and from the meat of strangled animals, and from the blood. Now, we just got a new company, a meat company. Man, I cannot wait. This is the first, I mean, I know New York is filled with kosher and have the kitchens and have it set up so they can prepare the meat properly. See, a lot of con uh, contamination has actually come from eating raw meat, you know, sitting up and you got this steak sitting on your plate bleed. Now you have to be careful with them with fish. You know, I went out to dinner and you're not going to serve me no raw fish. You're not going to serve my salmon talking about is, uh, is, is, what did she say? It's kind of just steamed in a sense. I said, well, I, I apologize, but I'm not, this, this me not bleeding, but I'm still not eating it raw. Okay. So therefore this kind of is a prerequisite. So you start being in compliance with keeps your body healthy. You know, since you, since most of you have your own entitlement and feel that should be number one, since you feel like your, your life is in your hands to do what you want to do with it, why not keep it healthy? Why not use what God's put before us to keep your body healthy? So strangle meats, animals, I'm sorry, it said animals, and from the blood. Let's skip on down because we want to go to Abram's and his descendants, and the substance for that is land. I love it. I love it. Genesis 15, which one of, one of my favorite in um, all of the scriptures in Genesis, really build on. But I love this one. And this one, I kind of know the story really better than maybe some of the others. And he said to him, take a heifer for me, three years old, and a, th and a three-year-old she-goat, and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took all of them to him and divided them down the middle and laid each piece and one opposite another, but he did not divide the bird. And when the birds of prey, P-R-E-Y, came down upon the caucus, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep came or fell upon Abram, 
and behold, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said to Abram, Know of a certainty that you, your seed will be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and not serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also that I am will, I am will judge the nation, that nation, that particular nation, hallelujah. He said he will judge them whom they will serve. Afterwards, they will come out with great possessions. Now, I'm going to pause right there. When I think about this, I think more than anything, dividing the land and, and who had control or authority to make decisions, uh, who possessed the land, because when they came out of Egypt, that was the top story. You know, I'm going to take my land back. And these are the very people that wandered around and never seemed to be able to go into in their land. That's probably why I have such an affection and um, closeness to the story. Because I believe that the confusion and, and the chaos that take place is people just trying to get to their land. And sometimes, you know, sometimes people get to a place in life, they have a, they soldier for the journey they need to take because they're, they're here in, in the earth realm for a mission. Most times I see that Yahweh he raises somebody up in a family. And he wants them, that particular person, to call that family together. You know, the most beautiful thing is that we not only just know, but we operate and we protect the young people. We protect the, the preservation of maybe using the example of saying, come on in and shut the door. Because this right here belongs in our bloodline. So every, every seed that's born through our lineage is to be protected. Now, the reason I'm sharing that with you there's some seed out there that probably wasn't uh, recognized, you know. And we're talking about people that keep a tight grip on family, you know. It becomes like a mystery all of a sudden because it wasn't counted in. You know, when, when Moses was taking the, cens the census, there was people, you know, in the families and a head count. So here you go down through the line, so much is happening. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, <laughs> God decides to raise up a prophet for that for that family. Now, there's some people already got the, you know, familiar uh, positions of being in authority according to what they know, according to what they believe the, the vision for the family is. It's always patriots and matriots in every family that's already been established, already been, you know, making sure they keep, keep a tight grip and, you know, they celebrate. They have a sense of dignity, a sense of, uh, you know, showing how well we can demonstrate what family really looks like. But all that stuff that they ain't accounting for, nobody knows about it. And they, and they, they don't take care, they don't realize that when God has done that, he not saying you're not doing a good job of what you're doing, he's actually bringing you a deliverer. He's bringing you a deliverer. And those things that um, have been causing, you know, um, some affliction, some disparities, that deliverer comes to find out how they can assist the family. They don't come to tear the family apart. They don't come trying to really find out your secrets or trying to, 
throw shade on you. They come to be a deliverer. God puts all that he needs to put within that person, like a calculation of what's going to be needed, the ingredients that's what's going to be needed. How can we get this family to rest in peace? How can we get this family at the understanding of how important it is to be one in Messiah? Mm -hmm. Genesis 15, 9, 21. As we carry on down a little bit farther, it talks about cut a covenant. On the same day, the Lord cut a covenant with Abram. To your seed, I have given this land for the river of Egypt, to the great river and the river of Euphrates, and the Kenite and Kenzanite, and the Kendonite, the Hittite, the Persicite, and the Ramium, Amorite, the Canaanites, the Jersonites, and the Jesusites. Jewish tradition relates to three animals, to Egypt, Rome, and Ishmael. It said animals, three, three to, these three, um, the well known as Orthodox, and uh, the Shalom of Jerusalem, when praying about the meaning of the two birds, there are released since that there was a uh, represent Judaism and Christianity. And when the annual day of prayer for peace of Jerusalem, which was in the time of probably in the month of October, released birds are the two that take the Lord's message of love to the world. The next covenant also tells of the Egyptian captivity. Again, he hasn't had a name change, so he's still Abram. And the substance of this as we just left the land, is the descendants and the prosperity. The plot thickens. The plot gets deeper. And I will give you my covenant between me and you and will multiply my, remultiply you exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face that God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be a father of many nations. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. So now, I'm going to stop with the father of many nations before we go any farther because these particular um, replays that I'm playing are so much better said um, or pronounced because sometimes I have to let my voice rest between the time that um, we're, we're in a lesson. And I don't want anything uh, that I'm doing to have any missing. Uh, when you replay them, I, I listen to them. Don't think I just play them. I go back and listen again and again because obviously there was something being um, put in to the minds and hearts of the people that hear his voice. Not everybody. Not everybody will hear what God wants them to hear from these particular replays. But by the way, there's no reason for you not to be obedient when it's something that you are supposed to carry out. And, and you don't expect anything from anybody because it's not even about the opinion of men. It's about the will of the Father. So here goes. First area I want to talk about is the mountain experience. When you're on the mountain, this is your season of success. This is where you're flying high. Everything in your life is on the up. You're being blessed. The money's coming in, the sun is shining, and it's in this season that you'll attract everyone and anyone. You'll attract people who want to be associated with you because of your success. You'll attract people who want to be associated with you so they can imitate and emulate you. You'll even attract people who want to be associated with you so they can take from you. And here's the thing. When all is well, you will attract more people. You'll have more friends, more phone calls, but no one will ever show you their true colors or intentions. No one will ever come out in the open and tell you the exact reason why they want to be associated with you. No one will ever tell you what's in their heart. But the Bible warns us, 
It warns us about hidden intentions and motives. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, in the Amplified Translation says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and it is extremely sick. Who can understand it fully and know its secret motives? We can understand three things from this verse. The heart is deceitful. It lies. It's fraudulent. The second is that the heart is described as extremely sick. This means it's desperately wicked. There's evil in the hearts of man. And finally, the heart has secret motives. And don't we all know that to be true? People will never show you their true colors when you're on top. When you're being blessed, very few will ever be truly happy with you. Not everyone who says congratulations will mean it. If you could see into the hearts of each and every one who is around you when God is elevating you, you would be shocked to find that some of the people closest to you will have envy in their hearts. Others will have jealousy, and some will have a plan to bring you down. Look at the example of Joseph. When Joseph started to be favored by God and God would speak to him through his dreams, the Bible tells that his brothers began to hate him. In fact, in Genesis 37, between verses 4 and 8, the Bible tells us that they hated him three separate times. But now, do you think Joseph would have ever thought his brothers would hate him? Or even worse, they would conspire against him and plot to kill him, but eventually sell him into slavery. This is the perfect illustration of just how deceitful the hearts of men can be. Now, you'll always find out people's true colors when you're in a valley, when you're in a low place, when you're down and out. This is where you find who is really for you and who is really against you. I say this because a lot of relationships and friendships are kept alive so long as there is something to be gained. Delilah was only interested in Samson because she wanted to bring him down. Be careful of such people. Mark chapter 7 verse 21 to 23 says, From within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. All of the things listed here, the Bible says they come from within, from within the heart of man. To the young lady listening, if you spend enough time with that young man, you will see his true colors. You'll soon find out that his heart is filled with godly fear and integrity or sexual immorality. Equally to any young man who is listening, if you spend enough time with that young lady, she will show you her true colors. You'll find out whether she has a heart filled with godly fear and integrity or sexual immorality. And even if you move away from a romantic relationship, look at those closest to you. Do they enable you to sin? To sin with them? Or do they rebuke you and encourage you to live in a godly manner, chasing after righteousness? This is why it's crucial and vitally important for us to pray that God leads us in all aspects of our lives, especially when it comes to those we should be associated with. Pray that God would reveal the red flags concerning any person with evil intentions in your life. And when you do this, and you really seek God's guidance, you will begin to see him highlight certain things. You'll begin to notice that this person only ever gets excited or happy when there's something for them to gain personally. They'll never have the same cheerful attitude if there is nothing for them to gain. If you are truly faithful to the Lord and ask him for the spirit of discernment, he will reveal to you the subtle ways in which a person may be tempting you, encouraging you, and luring you to do evil. Be careful when it comes to the people in your inner circle. 
<clears throat> Remember that the word of God warns us about the hearts of men for a reason. Too many people are betrayed. They're hurt and abused because they ignore the word of God that tells them how wicked the heart is. As long as you are connected to the Lord, as long as you are someone who is prayerful and led by the Holy Spirit, then you will be sensitive to the warning signs about someone who is evil in your life. Pray that God would open your eyes so that you can identify those people who will strengthen you in faith and Amen. You know the sneaky zip code solar trick to get solar panels from the US government for no Sorry upfront about cost that. and uplift you. Our enemy, the devil, wants to destroy the peace and joy God has given us, and he can even use others to do it. Consider this scenario. A woman joins a ministry in her church to try and reach the lost community. There are those around her who don't agree with the ministry and look for ways to convince others in the church, including this woman, why the ministry is not needed. They speak well and have a reputation of being people who have invested a lot in the church, and they will most likely have been members for a long time. Mm -hmm. Now, even though they proclaim Christianity with their mouths, their hearts proclaim something else. These types of people are out to destroy anything that brings others peace and joy. And so you and I should pray for discernment so we can identify these types of people. Pray for their deliverance, but still keep them at a distance so that they don't have any effect over us. It's so vital to your relationship with Christ to make sure you are surrounded by people who encourage you, who Amen. participate in doing the Lord's work Amen. and building up the body of Christ rather than tearing it down. It is a I want to pause right there. That is so good. That is so good. I want to read something to you. Bad company corrupts good manners. Some people come as a blessing, while others come as a lesson or a curse. We need knowledge to dis distinguish the truth from a lie. Satan masquerades himself as an angel of light and could be the bishop, could be the pastor, or could be the Sunday school teacher. Um, therefore, it is so important to know the word of God for yourself. That's the part is where the Holy Spirit, the, whoever, I mean, I don't know who's going to take the time to really learn and memorize scriptures. But right today, as we started out, that's what was brought to my attention. You know, get, get that word. And you know, it doesn't mean... The quantity has to be a lot, but get a get a good solid foundation of knowing the word of God, and he will increase you. This is for you to grow. Hallelujah. So therefore, it is important to know the word of God for yourself, have a personal relationship with God, and make sure you part take in the communion of the relationship. Avoid toxic toxic people and love them from a huge distance. I mean, we're talking about you might end up on <laughs> on your Facebook page with just three people. You know what? That's that three people have been whom the father discerned and you're cooperating and evidence that the spirit of truth and love and all of the fruits of the spirit are being uh, manifested, you and them three people, go for it. And, and, and that's another area that we haven't discussed, but it's very important. We already know, because if we're still trying to be with Cousin Lulu, and Cousin Lulu is a fun person to hang out with and laugh and talk, but co Cousin Lulu is not trying to study no scripture. Cousin Lulu probably would be the one you might have to give a sabbatical to. You know, you got to choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. Because see, Cousin Lulu is selfish. Cousin Lulu going to feel like, well, no, we have this. This is, this is greater than worrying about learning the Bible. 
because Cousin Lulu is going to not want to share. And you've got to be at a point where, you know, you choose, you make a choice. You know, we, we heard all day today, we can't serve two masters. It goes, it applies to every member of your family. I start with family, you know. It seemed like you, they didn't want to do nothing with you. Some of them family members didn't want to do nothing with you. Wouldn't even have call you. And the minute you start putting your foot down on the devil's neck, here they come calling. They got a plane ticket. They finna fly you somewhere, you know. So I just wanted to call that to your attention. A man of many friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. A lack of knowledge is what leads to destruction. Survive spiritual attacks with the word of God. The word of God will let you see through the clouds of deception. That's so beautiful. Blessings to you and favor and uh, continue to pray. That's just one evidence of a person who has been set apart, called, and they accepted their sure election to step into the realm of what we're speaking about. Amen. Matter if you're a new believer or have been a believer for many years, the enemy will use anyone he can to distract you from following the Lord. So be cautious and guard your heart from these types of people. Pray and ask God to put people in your life to edify your walk with him. A lot of us need to understand the behind the scenes, beyond what our natural eyes can see. God is pulling the strings. God is ordering your steps. You don't need other people's approval because at the end of the day, God has the final say. You don't need the validation of other people because God has the final say over your life. I believe that a lot of us, we place too much importance on the opinions of other people. Too many of us lock ourselves in cages where we place other people's opinions about us above the word of God. We place other people's opinions and ideas about what we should and should not do above the word of God. But here's something that I want you to be mindful of. You ought to be careful who you listen to. Be careful who you allow to whisper in your ear. I say this because in Job 1 verses 9 through 12, the Bible tells us about the devil's objective when he approached Job. The Bible reads, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands. And his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. And he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. The devil wanted to prove that Job only feared God because God blessed the work of his hands. And the devil suggested that if Job were to lose his material and worldly possessions, that he would curse God. Now I want you to understand this part. The devil thought that if Job lost his money, if he lost all of his houses, if he lost all of his land, he would curse God. Satan was out to prove this one thing, but I want you to notice his method. Part of his plan involved people. Part of the devil's plan involved using other people in order to get Job to curse God. Satan used a group of people called the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans to attack and destroy 
part of Job's empire. And if you fast forward through Job's story, once he lost everything and even his health, the Bible says in Job 2 verse 9, then his wife said to him, do you still? Is somebody going to do an investigation to Christianity? Where would you start? Oh, hold fast to your integrity. Curse God and die. Remember what the devil's objective was. The devil's objective was to prove the point that once Job lost everything, he would also lose his love for God and curse him. But when Job did lose everything, he still remained faithful to the Lord. He didn't curse God. But now here comes his wife. His wife here is encouraging him to do the very thing that the devil set out to prove. She was encouraging him to quit on God, to abandon God, to curse God. The lesson here is that we need to be careful about two groups of people. Those on the outside, so to speak. Those who come only to attack you. These are the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans. These people come into your life with the objective of attacking your character. They want to attack your reputation. They want to attack your name and gossip about you, discredit you, talk down on you. These are the Sabaeans and Chaldeans. Their objective is clear. Their stance is clear. They are against you. They are not for you. And they stand in clear opposition to you. This is the first group of people you should be mindful of. Then there's the second group. The second group are those who are in your inner circle. Those you do trust. These are the most deadly weapons the enemy can use. Mm -hmm. Those who you do have a relationship with. In Job's case, his own wife was encouraging him to literally curse God and prove the devil right. For you, it may be a childhood friend that will encourage you to turn your back on the Lord. Perhaps it may even be someone in a position of authority in the church. They may betray and discourage you. The point that I'm trying to make is that the devil can use people. He can use people outside of your immediate circle, your supervisor or co-workers even. And he can use people in your inner circle, family members, close friends even. All in all, the life lessons that we need to learn are God has the final say. His word has the final say. People will have their opinions. People who love you even. But you should never allow that to overrule the word of God concerning your life. You should never allow it to interfere with your relationship with Jesus Christ. The second lesson is that we absolutely need the guidance of the Holy Spirit so that we can filter truth from lie when it comes to the advice we receive. Not everyone who gives you advice has your best interest at heart. Amen. And furthermore, everyone who gives you advice isn't giving it from a place of love. Mm -hmm. But some people would secretly take joy in watching you fall. Yes. I Think of this. Really believe that's Judas, true. Judas, among the 12 disciples, was the one who carried the money bag. He was in the inner circle. He was trusted. Perhaps the most trusted because he carried the money for the group. Mm -hmm. But Luke 22 verse 3 says, Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. Satan entered Judas, according to the Bible. Jesus at one point turned to face Peter, but said the words, Get thee behind me, Satan. Job's wife encouraged him to curse God and do the very thing that the devil had set out to prove. All of these examples reinforce the point that I'm trying to put across. The devil can and often does use people. We need to pray for the grace of God 
so that we can discern the spirit behind the person. We need the grace of God when it comes to the people whom we go to for advice and counsel. We need to pray for the favor of God to fall on our lives so that we may be surrounded by godly men and women who are filled and led by mm-hmm. the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Do you know what the Christian life can be like sometimes? One day we can find ourselves walking closely with the Lord. We have days where we find that the spirit of prayer is strong and our faith is strong. The skies are blue, the sun's warm, and then all of a sudden, bang, a temptation jumps out of nowhere. The devil entices us with that one temptation, that one thing we struggle with. I don't know about you, but sometimes I win the battle. Sometimes I fall short. There is always a struggle. And if you're anything like me, you end up wondering, what went wrong? Why did I do this again? Well, in a way, nothing went wrong. Because this is how people are. We're in a fallen world. Mm -hmm. We're in a battle between the flesh and the spirit. Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 6 and 7. And the theme he touches on is to do with this internal battle. This battle between sin and purity. Between good and evil. Righteousness and unrighteousness. It's almost as though there's a strange force at work pulling us when we see a choice between right and wrong. This force leaps up. An opportunity to sin comes along and we're pulled to do what's wrong. Jesus' disciples knew this. Take Peter. The night the Lord was arrested, Peter got disoriented. He hurried through Jerusalem's dark streets and ended up in a courtyard by a fire, warming himself. Then a girl challenged him. Peter looked around the fire. He saw the priest's people and the soldiers. He felt an urge to do what was wrong. And he did. He denied Jesus three times then he stumbled outside and cried like a baby but wait what happened next a few weeks later jesus took peter aside and asked him to feed my sheep jesus helped peter use that terrible failing as a way to grow to be better to tend the flock Mm -hmm. to openly lead the movement no more giving into that temptation And he didn't. Years later, when Peter was offered the same option, he stood true. And for that, he was crucified upside down and killed. Jesus makes us clean. He helps us face up to our sin and become more righteous. Voices around us, of course, encourage us in the opposite direction. We see them on TV. We click to them across the internet. They say... You can have these things. Push Jesus to one side. Reach out and take the comforts, the prestige, the easy times, the pleasures. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about the occasional sin. Make a few moral lapses. Sin pays handsome wages. Do you hear this soft, confident invitation from the world? It's fake. Proverbs 11 and verse 18 says... A wicked man earns deceptive wages. It's the righteous man who earns a sure reward. Do you hear the offer to join in the glamour and the glory of the non-Christian life and lifestyle? In the end, that's all it is. It's just an empty offer. Mm -hmm. It doesn't pay like it promises. It's like taking a bite out of a beautiful wedding cake only to find it's made from raw sewage. Come on now. Praise In Yahweh. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17, God says, I am the Lord your God, who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. If only you had listened to me, your peace would have been like a river, your righteousness like the waves of the sea. This is the glorious freedom of the righteous life. Enjoy it.
That's so amazing. How can you go from a Christian making six figures a year? That is to so a amazing. I love letting this hit my ears. You know, letting it penetrate. There's a popular saying regarding success. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And mm -hmm. one quote I like reads, friends should be like books, few, but hand selected. Come on now, now. the Bible also weighs in on this topic of friendship. Psalm one verses one through two says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day Amen. and night. Amen. We all get to choose who we let into our lives. We can surround ourselves with like-minded people, with people who will build us up and encourage us to dwell richly in Christ. Or we can linger in the company of people who will lead us astray. People who will take us far away from God's perfect will for our lives. The choice we make when it comes to the company we keep, it can have serious consequences, not just in the short term, but in the light of eternity. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14 says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship? has light with darkness. This passage is often applied to the context of dating or marriage, but it applies in a general sense to friendships as well. We as believers should be more careful about who we let into our inner circle. That doesn't mean we can't have friendships with unbelievers, but we shouldn't allow ourselves to be yoked, to be tied, to be bound by them. We can't allow them to hold us back from following the Lord. Because while we might share certain hobbies or interests or life situations, at the end of the day, if we do not share the most important part of us, our faith, our trust in Jesus Christ, then that's a relationship that we don't need to maintain. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals no matter how good of a Christian you think you are no one is 100% safe from the influence of evil mm -hmm. if we're not careful we can allow ungodly people to hinder our own walk with Christ mm -hmm. as humans we are social creatures we tend to imitate each other's behavior and attitudes the more time we spend with certain people the more like them we become that's why the Bible warns us regarding the company we keep. Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Today there might not be anyone in your life that you would identify as a fool, but can you identify anyone who constantly attracts trouble and often brings you into it? You know, the devil can plant people in our lives who may seem genuine at first, but are actually harmful to our relationship with God. These people might end up discouraging us, betraying us, or even destroying us. However, when we surround ourselves with fellow Bible-believing, Bible-practicing, Christ-loving people, then our interactions become seasoned with grace and tenderness. We become better equipped to face the struggles of life when we know that we have a support system that stands with us, that prays with us, that intercedes for us, and that believes with us. Sometimes in life, God gives us people who aren't meant to stay, people who come to play their part, and the role they play in our lives can be powerful. They might be a mentor, they may be a friend, they might even be an opposer, Someone who challenges you, but inadvertently pushes you to do better. That's it. To be better at your craft. Amen. Better in your performance. Come on now. All people have an appointed time and season. That's it. All people will serve a purpose in your life according to God's will. But what we need to realize is that not everyone we love is meant to be in our lives forever. 
guy who had red flags all around him. And you've been with a girl who you knew was trouble. We've all been involved at some level with people or with a person who was bad for us. Now the strange thing is, have you ever noticed that it's those people, the ones with red flags, the ones who are trouble, it's those people that are the hardest to get rid of in our lives. And I mean, when you look at the long-term impact they have on us, the long-term negative impact they have, let them go. But that's never the case. So, might I suggest that sometimes God allows you to struggle and tussle with these toxic people, with these toxic friends, so that you may learn a lesson. So that you might learn not to invest your time and energy in people who drain you rather than support you.